Thank you, Dale. Good morning. I'm Sharon Andrews, and I'm the elder on call for this week. And our caregivers this week are John and Pat Hartwell, right there. And I always like when I'm up here because I get to see those beautiful stained glass windows that John made. Thank you. Um, the caregivers are here to help us. If uh, you know of anyone who needs a phone call, support, a meal, a drive somewhere, you can contact um, me or John and Pat. And I'd like to welcome you all to the service today um, in person and on Zoom. And those who are with us in the sanctuary, oh, sorry, I read what I just said. Uh, I especially welcome those who are visiting with us today. And I pray that you will find this a welcoming place to worship with those who follow Jesus, and we hope you will return and let us get to know you. And I'm going to make a few announcements, and if there's anyone in the sanctuary who has an announcement, you can come up after Karen makes her announcement. So first, I wanted to just let you know that the garden is thriving. Looks, it's a little overgrown looking already. Um, but there's a new gate that Alex Hawkins made, and it's such a beautiful creation. I hope you get a chance to look at it. And we can always use volunteers. And then after church today, we have a ping pong group that was a small group from the deacons' um, small group gatherings, but it's open to walk-ons if anybody wants to play. And that'll be right after the service. And Wes has um, let us know that um, on May 30th, Memorial Day, the, there will be a commemoration of the victims of war sponsored by the Orange County Peace Coalition and endorsed by our JPC group. And I have, it's on Zoom, so if you need the Zoom information, you can find it in the narthex after the service, or you could probably look it up online. Okay. Good morning. I am here to invite you all to Vacation Bible School. And I know what you're thinking, that's for kids, and you're tuning me out right now, but you're wrong. Especially after a pandemic, you're way wrong. So it is for our kids, it's for our youth, it's for our families, it's for our extended families, it's for young and for older than young, it's for our neighborhood, it's for those of us that don't want to eat alone, it's for those of us who just need a laugh, and for those of us who miss this beloved community. So it will be two Friday evenings in June, the 10th and the 17th. We'll enjoy a meal together and pray together and play a little bit together. And I cannot stress enough how this is a time for all of us to gather and connect and get to know one another again. Uh, so you can RSVP in the narthex for food purposes. It'll be good food, I promise. It'll be just a couple hours on a, on a few Friday evenings, and I hope you will consider joining us. And you can see me with any questions. Thanks. Please stand as you are able for our call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. I invite you to remain standing as we sing hymn number 851 in the Glory to God hymnal.
You may be seated. Do not let your hearts be troubled, but confess your sins, and God will give you peace. Loving God, we confess, we confess that we are an anxious people who deny your blessing and fail to keep your word. Forgive us, we pray, for these and all our sins, that we might live in peace and reflect your love in the world. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Good people of God, hear this good news. Let your heart be still. For God loves you and forgives you all your wrongdoing. And beloved, receive the peace of Christ. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Living God, you sent your apostle to preach the gospel to women gathered by a river in a secluded place of prayer. There, a businesswoman named Lydia was led by the Spirit to hear your word as truth. You opened her heart in love, and she opened her home for the spreading of the gospel. By the power of your Holy Spirit, fling wide the doors of our hearts this day as we hear your word of life that we too may open our lives to serve your world in love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Gospel reading today is from the book of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9 and 14. Soon another feast came around, and Jesus was back in Jerusalem. Near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda, with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people were in these alcoves. One man had been invalid and there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he'd been there, he said, do you want to get well? The sick man said, Sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. By the time I get in there, someone else is already in. Jesus said, Get up. Take your bedroll and start walking. The man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and walked off. A little later, Jesus found him in the temple and said, You look wonderful. You're well. Don't return to a sinning life where something worse might happen. I wonder what pain the man felt. I wonder if it was painful for him to get up and walk. I wonder if 
We want to be healed. I wonder how we can heal. I wonder what it's like to claim our power. The gospel for us. Praise to you, O Christ. Occasionally, the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Occasionally in Scripture, you run across a place where they skip a verse. In today's Scripture, John chapter 5, verse 4, if you go home and look in your Bible, is missing. The reason is because there was a monk back in the 5th century who did all the chapter numbers and verse numbers. And he had a version of the Gospel of John that had what he numbered verse 4. But scholars later discovered that that was something that was stuck in by later editors. That the original Gospel of John did not have that verse in there, but it was stuck in to explain the Pool of Betzata, which was the place in Jerusalem where um, all of the folks who ha- were differently abled gathered. Um, folks who were blind, folks who were deaf, folks who couldn't walk, et cetera, et cetera. They gathered at the Pool of Betzata. And the reason that they gathered there is because it was believed that an angel came down from heaven on occasion, got in the pool, and stirred it all up to take a bath. And that if you were the first into the pool when it got stirred up by the angel, you would be healed. And so all these folks gathered around the pool and waited until the pool would foam and bubble up. It almost certainly was a geological feature of the pool, that water or steam would bubble up from the bottom and it would turn ruddy red. But that's what they believed. That's why folks hung out there. And so you had this whole area of the city, and it had um, five colonnades around it. So you can imagine what it was like to walk into that part of the city. The folks who were um, discarded by their society and told that they were lame, told that they were different, told that they were limited, told that they were only partially human. That's where they gathered, and their hope was to be healed. So for today's reading, I um, reinserted that bit of the verse, and Karen covered it. I was recently um, having lunch uh, with a physician friend of mine, And uh, she likes to remind me that there's a distinction between being healed and being cured. It's her favorite story. She said, I can cure you if you take your medicine, but I have no power whatsoever to heal you. That is an entirely other matter. She told two stories to illustrate her point. She was once working with a 10-year-old who had fibromyalgia, who was clearly dying. And despite that, the child was bright and positive, and her parents, who were fairly old to have a 10-year-old, were not doing well. So the doctor asked, how are your parents doing? Well, it's sometimes okay sometimes not, but I keep telling them that no matter what, everything is going to be okay. And how's that working? Eh. And while this child was not cured, in fact, could not be cured, she did show remarkable signs of being healed. The parents, while not needing a cure, were showing signs of needing some healing. 
and understandably so. The roles were reversed where the child was taking care of the parent because the healed always take care of the spiritually broken. She told me another story. She was working with a 16-year-old young lady who needed a, a lung transplant. And Anita was avoiding this young woman in the hospital because it was just very personally painful to watch. And finally, this young woman came around the corner and caught the doctor in the hallway, locked eyes, deer in the headlights. And she walked up to Anita and she said, why are you avoiding me? <laughs> and Anita was like, mm. and this young woman said, do you know why children have to suffer so much before we die? And she went, and the young woman said, so that you adults will let us go. We have to get so sick and suffer so much that you will finally just say, okay, okay, let her go. That is what it means to be healed. It means that fear no longer has us in its grip. That is to say, you might still feel afraid of your situation, but that fear doesn't have the power over your decisions or your actions. And this is why those who have become healed often have tremendous power to speak directly and profoundly to our deep hurt and our fear in a way that is transformative. And so with that definition in mind, we run across a story in which Jesus comes and asks the question that all great healers ask. Do you want to be made well? It is a really important question. And I went to some other Bibles just to sort of verify the translation of that one sentence, that one question. And the further I went, the more Bibles I opened. Here's what I found. The English Standard Version says, do you want to be healed? The New Revised Standard Version says, do you want to be made well? NIV, do you want to get well? New American Bible, do you want to be well? Jerusalem Bible, do you want to be well again? Amplified, do you want to become well? New American Standard, do you wish to get well? New English Bible, do you want to recover? King James, wilt thou be made whole? <laughs> Amplified Bible, a second time, are you really in earnest about getting well? Oh, that one. You know that when nine different versions of the Bible have ten different translations of the same verse, you're onto something. Because it's beating all around a bush. Just going, take it like this, try it like this. Did it land like this? Try here. Uh uh, no, not yet. Okay, how about this one? We're onto something deep when we can't quite get the words right. That's why Jesus tells stories about the kingdom of heaven in parables. And doesn't just tell one parable, tells a lot of them. Because this kingdom of heaven thing is slippery. It'll get right through your fingers and you'll miss it. Or you won't get the whole thing. And so he just keeps working us around and around and around, trying to get us to get it in the best way possible. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? Do you want to get well? Become well? Be well? Wilt thou be made whole? Are you really in earnest about getting well? 
It's the kind of question that reaches right in and demands that we make what the 12-step program calls a searching and fearless inventory of ourselves. Do you want to be made well? Really? Because I want to submit to you that there are parts of all of us that are not even remotely interested in being well. In fact, I'd suggest that there are parts of all of us that are quite interested in not healing and quite comfortable with remaining just as we are. Thank you very much. Have you ever been in a situation where someone was behaving badly and you called them out on their bad behavior and they immediately denied it? I had a friend one time that was at a coffee shop and they were overhearing gossip in the next room of the coffee shop that was loud and shameless. And they were talking about someone that this person knew and loved. And the gossip was getting more toxic by the minute. Mean, untrue. And this person sat there and listened to it for 15 minutes and then got up, went into the other room, and said, that's enough. You are talking badly about someone I love, and it needs to stop now. And do you know what they did? They denied it straight to her face. Oh, well, we we didn't really mean that. I mean, we're just talking. I mean, I actually love that person too. Really? Or you call them out on their bad behavior and they immediately say, well, if you had knew knew what I had been through, you wouldn't be saying that to me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. You end up apologizing to them for their bad behavior. That ever happened to you? There's a part of all of us that is sick and either wants to deny or legitimate it. And there are parts of all of us that are actually invested in being sick. It either keeps us feeling superior or in control, or it allows us to really enjoy the power trip of getting to act however we want to, or it feeds the fantasy of our alternative realities about ourselves that we get to be someone we're actually not, which really feels good for as long as the fantasy lasts. But staying sick is actually very attractive in many ways to all of us. The man who lays by the pool may be lame, but he has been laying there for 38 years in the disabling fantasy that something magic in the water is going to save him. In fact, did you notice his response to Jesus? Jesus asks him a simple, direct question. Do you want to be healed? And he goes right through that question, out the backside, and says, well, if you knew how many times I've tried to be healed and almost got into the water, but someone else beat me there and stole that healing from me, then you wouldn't be asking me that. Really. It is someone else's fault that you are not healed. He never even answers the question. He is so fully invested in the identity of victim or lameness or broken or not whole or not fully human that he can't even address the confrontation of the question. Now, Jesus, being the healer that he is, is familiar with these patterns. He's heard this before. You yourself may have prayed such a thing. And so he sidesteps this little attempt to redirect the confrontation and says, get up and walk. He's having none of it. Get up and walk. It's time. For 38 years, you've been laying here putting your hopes in a miracle. How's that going? 
I am here to stir up the waters of that fantasy, and it's time to make a change. It's time to be healed. It's time to be healed. In fact, let me suggest to you that you are already healed. You are good enough. You are completely whole as you are. It does not matter what they say about your abilities. They are not differently abled. You are whole and full. And I want to encourage you. Get up and walk just as you are. We don't know if the man was cured of his physical malady. We always assumed that he was. But we're not told. But what we do know is that he becomes healed. And that is, his identity as an invalid changes. It becomes transformed. He gets up, walks away from that place of invalids, that identity as invalid. And Jesus sees him later and says, well, look at you all walking around, looking healed. The Holy Spirit of Christ comes to us and stirs up our waters, shakes up our little snow globes to interrupt any wallowing or stagnation or festering to say, now don't go back to that whiny, self-deprecating victim identity. That's what made you sick and stuck to begin with. Do you want to be healed? Then get up and move. Get out of this awful funk you're in. This is ridiculous. Stop acting like this. You have agency. I made you, and I love you just as you are, and too much to let you stay here. So get up and walk. Oh, and sin no more. And this is an important point. Sin no more means don't go be lurking around this cesspool anymore. Don't be putting your faith in superstitious nonsense anymore. And don't be sneaking back around the block waiting for me to walk off so that you can come back here and re-enter all of these festering, invalid, blaming everyone else for why they are not healed. Don't be returning to those old patterns of thinking and acting that have wasted 38 years of your life. Get up and walk and sin no more. Do you want to be healed? And the question is, do you want to be healed? Not, do you think that person you're living with needs to be healed? <laughs> Not, do you think your friends need to be healed? Not, do you think the Republicans need to be healed? Not, do you think Congress needs to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Because two things are true. Each of us has to face our own brokenness. Healed persons have no power to heal the world. They only have power to open us to becoming healed. And then they point us to what healing looks like. And second, healing is a choice. At least on this side of the grave. Healing, that transcendence of fear and shame and guilt and control, is always a choice over here. And the choice to be healed is not mandatory. You don't have to do it. But Lord have mercy, it makes life better. Now over there on that side of the grave, in that distant land, the healing that happens over there, we got no power over that. That is entirely in God's hands. But we are promised that because of Christ's woundedness, our healing is complete. And I don't know how it works. But I do know why. Because God lo so loved the world that God could not bear to let it perish in its own sickness. God did not send Christ into the world to condemn it, 
but to heal it through himself. All of that is to say nothing of the systems that were in place that put all of those people around the pool of Bet Zatha and led them to think that they needed to be there. This is to say nothing of the systems that put poverty into place and ensured that the people in poverty would stay there. One of the little fragments of this story that we didn't tell is that the man gets up and goes to the temple and he's walking around carrying his mat. And the authorities say, hey, it's the Sabbath. Don't be carrying your mat around on the Sabbath. That's against the law. What they didn't miss, or what they didn't know, is that he's been sitting for 38 years. He has finally found his agency to get up and walk, and what do they tell him? Get back down there and sit down. Those are the systems that, in place, that are in place, and they are in place at that Jerusalem, and they are in place in this Jerusalem. And there are folks that we tell you are broken. You are an invalid. You are half a person. You are disabled. And we do our own part in relegating them to the pool of Betzatha. Do you want to be healed? How do you seek healing in the midst of such systems that we participate in largely unconsciously? How do we seek healing? What kind of healing does Jesus bring for such systems? It begins where two or three are gathered in his name. Jesus comes to us. You notice Jesus in the story shows up at the pool of Bethsatha. It's a festival. He could have been at the temple praying, but where does he go? He goes to the pool of Bethsatha. That's where you will find him. Attending to those for whom systems and powers and self-deprecation have relegated them to hoping for miracles. And he says to them, and he says to me, and he says to us, do you want to be healed? Do you want this to be healed? Then claim your agency and get up and take your mat and walk. And by the way, that's illegal to take up your mat and walk on the Sabbath. He didn't flinch. Get up and walk. Good people of God, we are confronted in this Easter reality about a life of resurrection and what it means. And it means that not only are we healed, but we are challenged to go liz, live as if it were true and to tell everyone down at the pool of Bethsatha to invite them, to go to them and accompany them and invite them to get up and walk and to walk with them. The thing is that, the, is that Jesus is the one who circles back around and reconnects with him later and goes, well, look at you all walking around, all healed up. The story does not end with Jesus just down at the pool of Bethsatha. He comes back and follows up and checks in. That is Easter life. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. I invite you to rise. If not in your body, then in your soul and sing him 796.
Thank you. I call you now into a time of prayer. Uh, celebrations include. Uh, this is from Nancy. Glory to be to God for our wonderful Earth Sabbath last Sunday at New Hope Camp and Conference Center. Thanks to all who participated, especially those who brought a multitude of talents to share. I'd like to remember Richard Stevens, whose memorial service was held at the camp yesterday. His uh, deeply dedicated service as executive director of New Hope Camp and Conference Center, Center since 2006 helped it survive and thrive, a continuing gift to our community. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Um, this is uh, from the uh, prayer chain. You may have already read it, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, this is from Sarah. My daughter Emma, whose childhood and teen years were lovingly shaped by the wreck, was married on April 29. We celebrate her marriage to Cameron Kales, her partner of many years outside of Charlotte on a lovely Friday. We were so thankful to have all my family attend, many of her dad's family and some close friends. Folks traveled from as far as Houston and San Francisco. We are thankful for the support of so many and celebrate Emma and Cameron as they start this new chapter of their journey together. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. From Ann, I'm celebrating that we had a fantastic trip to Mackinac Island uh, with the girls as much needed break for us all. The concern is that Chris, Rachel, and Sarah came down with COVID Monday. Departure day. Ah! Their symptoms are relatively mild and improving. We drove back instead of flying and are all safely home. Um, Ann, I, I, Ann, remain asymptomatic and testing negative, but will continue to limit in-person activity. But prayers for clarity amid the confusing recommendations about when I can consider it safe to be in contact with my elderly parents again. It's a bit murky. And so, uh, and do be sure to thank Charlie Bowers this Sunday, uh, who stepped in uh, to cover directing Zoom for the first time and with no backup as I was scheduled and Michael and Jess are on out of town. Thank you, Charlie. For those who didn't look or are on Zoom, Charlie beamed. <laughs> um, oh, here's maybe my favorite of the week from Sharon. To tell you very quickly, I rang the bell tonight at Duke Cancer Center, and I rang it loud. You can ring the bell when your last chemo has taken place, and it looks like this is the case. 125 cancer marker down to, one, uh, to 15. 125 to 15, and all other tests look good. I will have a CT scan to confirm and another meeting with my brilliant oncologist regarding a medicine regimen to help keep me in remission. It was a very, very long six months, and there have been a few moments when I wanted to give up. Then one of you or another dear friend would call me, bring food, flowers, suggest a book, bring me news, and uh, I would go on. You were with me all the time. I recognize that and thank you for it. We won another round. God heard your prayers. Amen. God in your mercy, hear our prayers. And let's see, this is concern. Uh, any celebrations you wanna share in the room? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Uh, so I will treat this as a so, oh, it is a celebration. Thank you. Bill and Sharon will be traveling to Kentucky this coming uh, weekend to celebrate the graduation of Kendra Miller Green from Transylvania University. Kendra has worked hard this last four years, and we are all very proud. God, in your mercy. Say hello to Kentucky for me. We miss it. All right, turning to you all. Celebrations? What are you grateful for this week? Shirley, what are you grateful for? In two sentences. <laughs> Last night I saw a movie. <laughs> it's called um, What You Have by Sam Uh-huh. And I was in the Yeah. Every day. And I sat there and I, and I thought to myself, this is about me. Ah. This is about my family. 
good. Good. It was a it was a movie or a play. Okay, Shirley is sharing that she's grateful she saw a movie that reflected back to her something about herself and that very similar to today's scripture and felt empowered to do to do something also. God in your mercy. What else are you grateful for, Bron? <laughs> Braun is saying thank you uh, to the congregation. Patricia, his uh, partner, spouse, uh, had knee replacement surgery, and um, they have eaten very well this past couple of weeks. So thank you, congregation. God in your mercy. Others. Beth. Beth Bale is grateful for 27 years of marriage and some vacation. Hallelujah. Others. For a holy boldness to ask Jesus to heal us. Yes, good. Prayers for a holy boldness to ask Jesus for healing uh, in the way we need it and in the way we need it. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let's, yeah, Jeep. This is for when people need to speak. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's dangerous. We're getting back to the mic, passing around. I'm not ready for that yet, G. Personally, I'm not. I'm just not ready to go there yet. I, I saw the break of life with Ross Metcalf. A few friends of Dan's died last night. Um, he was in his twenties. Um, but anyway, for the break of my parents, uh, for her husband Peter, their children got to San Diego, and for all his friends. The life of Ross Metcalf who uh, was a friend of uh, Dale and Jan's, um, who passed prayers for their family and their loved ones. God, in your mercy. Let's turn to concerns. Um, this is from Babby. I'd like to ask for prayers for our granddaughter, Maddie, who unfortunately has regressed and is in uh, the psychiatric hospital in Salt Lake City. She was doing better, but that didn't last, and so we pray that a, place, uh, a placement would be found where she could um, not only be safe, but also get better, so that eventually she'll be able to return to her home without a fear of self-harm. God, in your mercy. This is from Pauletta. Bob and I asked for your prayers for healing uh, for our niece, Julie, last week. Julie was diagnosed with breast cancer. Thankfully, early and small, Julie had her follow-up appointment today. The plan is an MRI with and without contrast. This will be followed up by a lumpectomy and radiation, please pray for guidance for her medical team and successful treatment and resolution of this unwanted invader. Julie is the daughter and only child of Bob's sister, Susan, who died a little more than a year ago. We had not known Julie since she was about 12, and she is now in her late 30s. We are so glad to be reconnected. God, in your mercy. In a couple of sentences, do you have any concerns that you'd like to share with the congregation? Yes, Anne. Amen. Uh, Alex and Ann, the Gordon's um, dog, what was his name? Franklin. Franklin. Uh, passed this last couple of weeks, and um, it sounds like there's been a real vigil of care around him. God, in your mercy. Others. Yes, ma'am. Anniversary of a death of a friend, of a friend's 
Father? It's the, okay. God in your mercy. Others. Let us pray. We come with so much this day, O God. So much that feels healed and so much that still needs it. Sometimes even things that need to be cured and some things that can't. We come with so much that we're holding. Acknowledging you as beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, the hope of all the nations, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer, the source of our well-being and life and confessing that there is a part of each of us that longs to lurk around the pool of Betzatha. And there's a part of all of us that wants to ignore and avoid the reality that there is a pool of Betzatha. Come to us once again, O oh God, challenging us with the question of whether or not we will be healed. If we want, if we are resolved, if we are in earnest about healing, help us to take that question on with depth and seriousness, and help us also to take on the deeper question, the broader question of the ills of our society that need healing. We lift all of these things up to you, O oh God. Where else would we turn? You are our anchor and our deep well, the place where we gather for redemption, for healing, for wholeness, to be reassured, to find hope again. Be our rock and our redeemer. Help us to receive you and lean into you as rock and redeemer. And give us the strength and the wherewithal and the, the healing to be Easter people in an Easter world, transforming it from this to the new heaven and the new earth. Now hear us, O oh God, and reserve your judgment as we offer the prayer Christ taught us, praying, Holy God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us away from temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite you to our offering. The earth has yielded its increase and God has richly blessed us. Therefore, bring your tithes and offerings and come into God's courts with praise. You can leave an offering in the basket at the door when you leave, or you can um, do it through this little thing on your program. And John Hartwell is going to share with us about one of the missions of our church. At least half the people in this room know what it is I'm going to say. I'm going to tell you that um, you have been a wonderful congregation supporting this mission to Guatemala for all these years. I'm going to name um, dozens of trips, hundreds of travelers, thousands and thousands of dollars. I'm going to talk about building clinics and having heifer projects and water projects and building sewing schools 
and offering scholarships and um, uh, just on all the stuff that we have done. And, um, and, and then I'm going to end by thanking you especially for the outpouring of support that came following the Bill Peck's memorial service and uh, assure you that we have sent yet more thousands of dollars and um, we've also bought that little printer for the um, uh, ultrasound machine and Cindy Moore will carry it down with her next month. And I, I, I like that speech. I, I've given that speech many times. And the, the only problem with the speech is it doesn't tell why. And um, as, as this gentleman has uh, taught me in just two months on the job, in order to tell why, you have to tell a story. And um, I, so I'm going to tell you a story, which means we're going to move into somewhat less familiar territory. All right, so this is. This is a trip, this was a really big trip when we were rewiring the entirety of that mob complex. And so lots of equipment and skilled people and stuff like that were, were traveling. And Kip Gerard and I went a couple of days early to make sure everything was in place, that we could receive all these folks. And, and foolishly, I guess, we set out from RDU, planning to just go right straight to the mom center in one day. And um, usually people break the trip in Guatemala City, but, but we weren't going to do that. We're skilled travelers, right? So uh, I, it didn't go well. Um, big delays in Miami, and then we couldn't get the express bus, and so we had to take local buses. And by the time we got there, we were going to get there in the afternoon. But it was dark, and we were really tired, and we'd walked the last couple of kilometers carrying big packs, and we were really beat. And so we pounded on the door where Rosario and her sister Maura were living, taking care of the clinic. So these are the two characters in this story, Rosario and uh, Sister Mara. You've heard Rosario's name many times, right? She, she's 70 or next birthday, so a little more than 50 years ago as a teenager, she literally walked out of the woods and presented herself at that mom center to enroll in the uh, training program for midwives. I mean, she was apt as soon as she was teaching in that program, and by the time I got to know her 35 years ago, she and her sister Maura lived in the house there and ran the clinic. I mean, they scheduled the doctors and kept the inventory and bought the medicine and booked the patients and trained the midwives and all of it, and she put herself through high school at that point and was going to counting school at night, taking a degree in Chela. I mean, this, this is a woman now that walked 14 hours from Concepcion to get down to that thing as a teenager. I mean, she's starting from nothing. So we, we knock on their door, right? It's late, and um, they've, they've saved supper. So that's just great. I, I mean, that is the first thing to do for weary travelers, feed them, right? And so they've got supper, and somehow it falls to me to say grace. And so in terrible Spanish, but with sincere appreciation, I offer my thanks. And, and it's clear in that minute for me that who it is that's ministering to whom. Right, Kip and I say we're on a mission trip, but it's clear who's doing the receiving here. And so after supper, very shyly, Maura, Maura, now some of you know her. She's real small. She's got congenitally shriveled arms. And she is just nothing in this culture, and she is seriously bright. She is the power behind the throne, the person with whom Rosario concocts all these plans to make uh, non-governmental uh, organizations and build these clinics and stuff like that. Maura is the center of will in all of this. And Maura shyly gets out two bottles of beer. Now, now it, alcohol has a terrible place in this culture. And 
Alcohol is totally forbidden by the Presbyterians on this mom center, but she has smuggled these things in because she knows Kip likes beer. And I, um, I never learned to drink beer myself, but I, I really enjoyed dr drinking that beer. And um, I, I hope it's coming through in this story about who it is that's reaching across the cultural divide here. And so, so we drank our beers, and uh, then Kip and I went on to the big uh, building on the property to make our beds and open it up and get ready for the work crew that was coming in. And as we left, I could hear them right on for hours. They are giggling like schoolgirls over there. And it finally came to me that what it was that we were doing didn't have so much to do, what we were doing that somehow lightened their load had not much to do with the expertise and the people and the equipment that was coming in tomorrow. It had to do with the fact that we showed up. And um, this congregation has always showed up. And for that, I bless you. And your reward is to get to see the faith and work of your brothers and sisters who, on the surface, are so different in Guatemala. Thank you, John. Join me in the prayer for dedication. Giving God as spring bursts forth its blossoms in witness to your love, you bless us from generation to generation with the new life of Easter faith. All that we have and all that we are come from you. O oh God, so we gladly share this offering that others too may be blessed for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. I invite you to rise, circle up if you dare, and sing the hymn of the church. Hear these words from Scripture again. Now in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate there is a pool called in Hebrew Bet Zatha, which has five porticos, and in these lay many ill and blind and lamed and paralyzed people, waiting for the stirring of the water. And one man was there who had been there for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? Good people of God, we are looking every day for ways to be better, to be healthier, to be more vibrant, to be better citizens, to be less stressed out, to work less hard, to be kinder, to be more generous, to be more just, to find humility. Do you want to be made well? Yeah, 
Yeah, we do. That's why we're here. That's why we hold hands. So that we do it together. So that we have friends along the way. So that at least in this little enclave, there will be a pool of Betzata where we all hang out and take care of each other so that we can go back out into those systems and model it and be light and be sources of transformation and to be a little bit of healing, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of generosity to those who are convinced that they are relegated to the pool of Betzata. That is who we are. That is what we do. So go in peace, knowing that the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of Jesus Christ go with you this day and every day. Amen. I want to say a thank you real quickly to Dale Herman for working in, for working in today to our worship service, The Beauty and the Beast. I love it when a Disney princess makes her way into our worship service. Thank you for that, Dale. I also want to thank Charlie and Eli who are running Zoom today. Please note that our entire online effort is being run by teenagers. How fantastic is that? And I want to thank uh, Courtney for helping us find sort of a medium ground about this round thing and the table, and this is our next little experiment. Thank you for that, Courtney. Um, thank you, Jeep, for the microphone idea. I appreciate it. It's me. It's not you. I'm trying my best to wade gently into this area of our worship together and giving you all some space to to say your joys and concerns. Zoom, we're gonna try to figure you out too. I want to figure that out, we're working on it. Stay tuned for further developments. Um, so thank you, G. I, I know, yes, good. Um, who else needs to be thanked today? You. Yeah. Oh, Janicia, thank you. I want you all to know something. Janicia comes to me every single Sunday and says, what isn't being done in the service that I can do? I want you to know that. Like, I think that is fantastic. Thank you, Janicia. I'm really grateful. Take notes. I'm teasing. Thank you, Janicia, for ringing the bell and lighting the candle today. Um, all right. The peace of Christ be with you. Go in peace, friends. No. Thank you for that. Temporarily able to. Uh huh. Is that right? <laughs> My former college roommate was the director of admissions at Transylvania for years. Isn't that cool? Yep. Oh, good, good, good. We can unmute. Um, yeah. Join room two. Tell this to join a room. I don't know. Huh? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Mm. But if you wanted to, you could get done. Let's see who who's on here. Well, we're not, oh, we're not. I see. Hmm. Nobody asked us to join, and we didn't join. I said that. But you leave a room.
Huh? You said there was a room? Yeah, and I was clicking and, and I unmute, so. Join breakout room.